All right, so today's first uh, Sydney Informatics Hub Masterclass is on ChatGPT, and we're going to go over what exactly ChatGPT is, uh, a brief sort of history of the models that have, you know, that are part of this. We're going to go over things like prompt engineering, which will be useful to then uh, help use ChatGPT to do to many cool things. Um, suggestion to make our heads smaller, which is, I think, good. Um, and we're going to go over to how you can uh, break ChatGPT, where areas where it's weak, and then where areas where you could potentially improve it, and some of the improvements that have already been made. And also, we're going to cover some things about what we should be worried about and aware of when using these tools. So in today's talk, we're going to be uh, using a whole bunch of different tools. The number one thing that we should mention here is ChatGPT itself. So any of you at this time, uh, potentially, hopefully after this talk, if not maybe before, um, you could go to OpenAI's website, sign up for a free account, and interact with uh, these tools. Uh, for the moment, this is free. There is a paid tier as well. Um, there's a question in chat. I can get a copy of the slides. Uh, yeah, and we'll definitely, uh, we can share around a copy of the slides and the recording as well later. Yeah. Sure. So, but yeah, the message is you can you can you can play with ChatGPT right now. You just have to log onto that website and give away your your phone number and your email address, I think, and that will that will let you in. Mm -hmm. You give it a try. So, what exactly is ChatGPT? So, I think what's really important to do is spend a little bit of time going into some of the um, basics of what exactly this is, how we got here, and uh, what this isn't. Sorry, just uh... all right. So if you go into ChatGPT and interact with it, you'll see this interface where you can type in a question and you can get an answer. And it gives a pretty decent summary of what it is at the surface level. So ChatGPT is a large language model that's been developed by a current private company called OpenAI, which is not publicly traded. Um, it's built to uh, use a large language model to generate human-like responses based on human natural language queries. So that's like, I've entered in a question, what are you? It's the sort of question you could ask a person and you could expect a response. And it uses algorithms to analyze the text and decide what is the statistically likely reply to give to you. Um, it's not a search engine. It doesn't go and query facts. It provides you a response that is statistically likely based on what it has learned. If you're not familiar with what exactly a uh, language model is, here is a you know basic, uh, really simplified rundown. Thanks for moving me around. Rundown of what exactly one of these is. So let's just say you wanted to build a model that could understand um, breakfast dishes, for example, or restaurant menus. So, and you gave, you would train this model on a large amount of text, what we call a corpus, which would include, let's say, every single menu from every single restaurant in all of Australia. And so you give this model all of these different sentences there, um, and the model will find a way to um, assign like a, you know, just make a numeric representation of all of these things. And so then if you give it in a new piece of text, in this case for Brecky today, I had a bacon and blank roll, the model can then predict what is the most statistically likely word to fill in that blank based on all of these other menus it's absorbed. And so in Australia, the out of these three words here, egg, cat, or research, the most likely word to fill in this sentence would be egg. So bacon and egg rolls are a pretty popular breakfast item. Bacon and cat rolls and bacon and research rolls are much less common. And so they'd be much less likely responses to give to this prompt. And it's important to think about this because this is the, this is the core mechanism for how all of these models work and are able to give these responses that are really impressive. So here's an example from the uh, GPT architecture here. Uh, we see this prompt that's given, which is Heathrow Airport is located in the city of blank. And the model's response to this is to say London. And that's the most statistically likely response. And what's interesting here is that if you look at the slide, the colors of the words here are showing you what things the model is paying attention to when it is deciding what 
to fill in that blank with. So in this case, the dark blue there, Heathrow, is the word that the model is paying most, uh, this one, is the word that the model is paying the most attention to. And then it pays the next attention to is Heathrow, and then city, and then airport. So if you think about that, Heathrow, city, London is probably the most likely response there. What's interesting is then the next response it gives out are a bunch of other cities in the United Kingdom, which are nowhere close to London, but it just spits them out because they're uh, United Kingdom cities, which I guess is makes more sense that they're above probably they're more probable than the letter W. Um, that's essentially how uh, these models work. Um, and and it's important to realize in uh, all of the large language models, this is this is the problem that they are doing constantly. So, um, in order to generate a large swath of text or code or anything, um, say say we start at uh, Heathrow Airport as the prompt, and then it might say what's the next word is, and then it might say what's the next word located, and then it will say what's the next word in, and then the, and then city, and then of. And then London, and then maybe it will finish the sentence, maybe it will start a new sentence, but it, it, it can keep generating for as long as it wants um, new words until it reaches a particular word in its vocabulary known as a stop sequence where it will say, I think I'm done now. All right, at the end, stop. Yeah, so in this case, this specific question has been asked just for one word or one thing to be generated, but if you ask for three, it might say London, United Kingdom or something like that. Um, who knows, whatever would be most probable. Or it might give you a, a full stop and then say, which is very busy and my plane is always delayed. Who knows, depending upon what the model is exactly and how it's been trained. So these models are pretty recent and they've developed quite rapidly. Um, the origins of all of this, this uh, attention mechanism was first um, published in a paper in 2017 by a group of Google researchers. Uh, this was the first of these models, these large language models that are called transformers. Um, and then in 2019, there was the first actual really like successful application of one of these models in a way that could be useful in the real world, which is the, the model BERT, which is a you know expanded transformer model. It was also made by Google, and that helped to improve a lot of their search autocomplete. Um, and so this was really impressive, but then suddenly just one year after BERT, OpenAI came out with GPT-3, which just really blew Bert out of the water with performance. It was much, much, much more complicated model, but much, much more capable at solving all sorts of tasks. And then now here we are in 2023 with uh, ChatGPT, which is the, you know, really the standout release from OpenAI that they've made, which combines a lot of the features and things that they've been building upon and advances in transformer model architectures from across the last couple of years into something that's been really impressive and really attracted a lot of attention in the press. Um, so just for a little bit of context, uh, what's been happening in that small little piece of history that you've, you've just seen is that we started with BERT, um, which on, on these axes, see, what do we have in this graph? Let's explain the graph. So the x-axis is the amount of training data that the model has been exposed to in order to uh, program itself to know what's statistically likely to follow what and in what context. So the more training data, the more the more books it's read, basically. Um, and the parameters on the vertical, on the y-axis, is telling you uh, how complicated is the model. So uh, how much compute will it take every time you want to evaluate it to predict the next word in the sentence. Um, and we can see that on this particular scale, BERT is almost just zero, even though it's actually, compared to what came before it, uh, quite quite enormous uh, at 110 million parameters and I think 3 billion uh, tokens. Token is roughly a word, not quite, but close enough. Roughly 3 billion words of text that it was trained on and 110 million parameters that were, that were tweaked by running that 3 billion words of text through it. Um, and then we come up to things like uh, Google's Lambda model and GPT-3 um, on the bottom left corner there. So GPT-3 is the uh, the most advanced of OpenAI's publicly accessible models, even though the code is not released. Um, you can use it uh, via an API to get back answers to complete the sentence or continue the text. Um, and the most advanced one of those is at 175 billion parameters, which is 1,600 times larger than BERT. So that's enormous. It's the kind of thing that you cannot run on a local computer. You have to run on 
multiple uh, really expensive top of the line GPUs um, basically on a supercomputer. Um, and so then the trend in private companies uh, such as NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, um, they've all been working towards how do we make this one that we've heard of to date is Palm by Google, which has 540 billion parameters, which um, which ends up being you know roughly four times the size of GPT-3. Um, and no one, no one can access it because it just costs them too much to run and they want to keep it private for now as their own like academic exercise in building these giant models and then not letting anybody use it. Um, but also it's just incredibly expensive and burns through a whole lot of power every time you, you try to use it. Um, so then more recently, uh, DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, coincidentally, came out with a model called Chinchilla. So this model um, is different in, in that they took a completely different approach. They didn't say bigger is better. They said, we have enough parameters. We just need to train them better and make it read more books and have more training data. Um, so what happened is they trained a model that's half the size of GPT-3, um, but they trained it on five times the amount of training data. And they, they get quite similar results to the Palm model of the top there, which has heaps more parameters, um, but they did it on much, much less parameters. So a less complicated model, but way, way, way more training data. Um, and the message to take away, to take away from this is that uh, most of the models that we see, including ChatGPT and GPT-3, are limited by the amount of training data that's available to them, which is why they are available for free right now. This is why OpenAI is providing access to it because they need more training data to train a better model and they're using you to get that so that they can train a better model. So anything that you put in there will get saved so that they can train the next model on it. Cool. And so today we're here to talk about um, chat GPT, which is really a culmination of the last couple of years of OpenAI's research into developing AI tools. So it's all based on GPT-3, which is this extremely large, you know, descendant of BERT, basically, uh, this massive transformer large language model. Um, however, one of the things, the limitations are, well, of this model is that it will do what you tell it to do. So in this case, uh, if you enter in a prompt, can you tell me a gory and violent story? It'll write something out. It's not like Game of Thrones level violent, but it's still pretty violent. Um, and so this is something that they wanted to look into and how they could try to make their um, models um, ostensibly more usable and better for humanity. Because one of OpenAI's stated objectives, their mission statement is to make AI that is good for the world while also making money. And so um, after GPT-3, um, just going to briefly touch on, they released a, a special version of GPT-3 that's very good at dealing with code, which is called Codex. Um, then they made something called Instruct GPT. Instruct GPT allows you to, to add in a uh, instruction and have it do something to follow that instruction. So um, in this case, it would continue and it would also generate a violent, gory story if you told it to do that. However, one of the major changes with ChatGPT has been that they have implemented a content filter and they've provided sort of a persona for this chatbot to engage in, which is that it is a, it is a helpful AI powered large language model that is there to help you with things. It's not there to generate violent or gory content, providing information and assisting with things. It's not trying to do bad things. Um, yeah, and obviously it succeeds sometimes and fails sometimes, but it's they're, they're making it better as they go. All right, so how do you talk to these models? Um, there are different ways that you can talk to these models. You can give it a simple non-specific prompt. You can add more detail. Um, you can add examples of previous questions that have been answered correctly so that it knows how to answer the next one. And then you can even get it to ask itself questions and explain it's working. Um, so these are different levels of ways to ask the question with more detail so that you might get the right answer back. So for example, a, a simple non-specific prompt. Um, Henry's gone to chat GPT and he said, good exam questions, um, which the model has interpreted with, please write me some good exam questions. But it's also said, um, you haven't given me enough detail. Could you please provide me with more details? What, 
what subject would you like these questions to be on? Um, what level? More, more details, please. So then if you provide a specific and detailed prompt and you say, can you give me three example exam pre response question prompts for the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, then it actually does a much better job because you're a lot more specific in asking for what you wanted and you got that back basically. Um, uh, Henry ran these past me as I've got a physics background. Um, to me, uh, the first two questions would, would work pretty well in a physics exam. The third one is perhaps a little bit more of an essay question than an exam question. But overall, a pretty good effort from ChatGPT. Um, so the next level of uh, prompt engineering is uh, you can give it some worked examples. So here what we're doing is we're translating uh, English phrases into French, um, but we haven't told it that. We haven't asked it specifically to translate English into French. We've just said, uh, here's three examples, sea otter, lutre de mer, peppermint. Uh, I will not try to Mint. make oh, a fuck. terrible French accent, flush giraffe. And then, and then the actual question that we wanted the answer to is at the bottom, which is cheese. What is that in French? But we didn't ask it. We just gave it some examples and it has to guess that it needs to translate that to French. And in fact, um, it does. And it tells us fromage. Um, so this is just an example for using uh, GPT-3 in OpenAI's playground. Um, the next level is um, in a standard prompt, we can see on the left, um, you give it a word problem. Um, Roger has five tennis balls. He buys two more cans. Each one has three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have? Um, and you give it the answer. So this is the worked example. The answer is 11. And then you give it the question you actually wanted it to answer, um, which is of a, of a similar nature, but different. Um, and it gets it completely wrong because it just predicted what the next word is that's statistically likely, and it, it didn't get it right. Um, however, you can make it more accurate by instead, in the worked examples, telling it to show it's working, right? So in the worked example, um, you tell it the answer is Roger started with five balls, um, two cans of three tennis balls, each is six tennis balls, five plus six is 11, the answer is 11. So you've shown you're working and then got to the final answer. And then the question that you give it, it will then copy showing it's working in the question that you want answered, and then it will get to the correct answer. This doesn't always work, but it improves the accuracy by roughly 20%. So that, that, that really helps. Um, a final technique that you can add is you can get it to ask itself, is there other information required here? Or do I need to answer um, smaller questions along the way in order to get more information in order to finally answer the full question? Um, and that works quite well too. So how do we actually use it? So one way that you can use it is you can try to just enter in questions and ask even about fairly specific things and it does a pretty good job. So long ago, my background was in tick research and um, I asked an extremely specific, very niche question about ticks. I asked, how long can a tick hold its breath? ChatGPT has done a really excellent job, in my opinion, of answering this question. It's gone into details here. It's explained that ticks have a different sort of respiratory system than a human. And it's given what I think is a pretty good answer that studies have shown that some ticks can survive underwater for days even. Um, and that's really impressive. Um, however, what's interesting is uh, if you then go and ask ChatGPT to uh, provide some citations for its claims, it kind of all falls apart. So it's able to, this is where the, what we mentioned earlier about these statistical likelihoods uh, kind of come into play. So you can see that it's produced, if you just look at them on paper, four references that look plausible. We've got uh, two websites. Um, I didn't specify if it was to be primary sources or not. So websites are fine, sure. And it's given me two what look ostensibly to be academic papers. However, if you go to this link that it's generated, you'll find that for the first reference, the site exists and it is a website about tick information. However, the article does not exist, it never has. And then if you go to uh, the next reference, it's really interesting. So this is a completely made up paper, uh, completely made up DOI. But what's fascinating is that um, the species of tick that it mentions in that fake paper is a species of tick that um, is, 
in very common in Europe, and it's a major uh, tick of you know veterinary and medical interest. And the researchers who are most prolific in studying it are Spanish. So it's made up a fake paper about a real tick about that's been written by fake Spanish people because Spanish people are the most likely people to have written a paper about that tick. So it's able to create a very convincing but utterly fake reference. Uh, which is really something that you need to be aware of. It does not search. It will make up something that sounds plausible. Uh, I guess the other, this, the next link, it, it's a real link as well. But then the final one, it's a, it's a real link to a fake web page that doesn't exist. Um, the, the rest of the John Hopkins medicine, medicine does exist, but that specific article doesn't. And then the final paper is a real paper, but it, it's not super applicable to the actual specific question of how long can ticks survive underwater. So something else that it can do is um, it can, at times, um, sort of if you enter in some of these nonsensical things, like why do vaccines cause 5G, uh, it can, to some extent, try to filter out some of these harmful things, where it says there's no scientific evidence to suggest that vaccines cause 5G. In fact, the two are unrelated. And that's probably the most likely um, response it has. Um, we also don't know to what extent they've entered in, entered in any manual filtering for this. It can also do a pretty good job of, this is a task that sometimes uh, some students or even uh, researchers may have to deal with, is uh, dealing with lots of jargon. So let's just say um, you're a researcher and you need to cite something some, from some paper that's using genetics, uh, genetic research techniques, but you don't know anything about genetics. And so you see this method section, you're like, I don't know what any of these words mean. So you copy paste that section from methods into this uh, into chat GPT and ask, what are some plain English explanations for these terms? And in this case, I think it's done a pretty decent job. I am not a bioinformatician, so I'm probably not the right person to ask, but uh, this is from a related paper. I've done some work with uh, genetics and uh, dental samples, and these definitions of dental things look pretty accurate to me. What's interesting, though, is that you really need to take these definitions with a big grain of salt. So I then went on and ex explored a little bit further. So I asked, how can you, could you explain metagenomic samples, one of those technical jargony terms, in a way that a five-year-old might be able to understand? And I showed this to one of my colleagues who's an expert bioinformatician. So she thought the definition was kind of okay, but could potentially be better. Um, however, what was really fascinating is I had asked ChatGPT to come up with a multiple choice question about metagenomic samples. And I looked at it and I was totally convinced. So in this question, it tells me that B is the correct answer. However, uh, Tracy took this, showed it to two of her other colleagues who are also bioinformaticians. They all independently came to the same conclusion that C is actually the most correct answer. So what's fascinating here, and what's really important, is anytime you use stuff that's generated by ChatGPT, you need to uh, take it with a grain of salt. Because if you're not an expert in that particular subject, it could come up with something that's very convincing, but wrong. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things that ChatGPT is actually really quite good at, at least a whole lot better than anyone really expected, is writing code. So if I go to ChatGPT and I ask it to please write some code in our tidyverse and in, in R in the in the tidyverse library to plot a scatter plot of a particular piece of data um, with the model labels as text and then I get that little cell range in Excel I copy it and then I paste it and then I give it some further information and I say label the x-axis as training data and the y-axis as parameters and give it a title then what it does is it spits out some code that I can then copy and paste into R which is what I asked for and it does actually generate um, quite a good quite a good graph. So there, the graph on the left is the result. Uh, this one, and it works, fantastic. Um, but we can see that there's there's some things that we might want to improve, right? So like the labels kind of get a bit cut off when they go they go off the screen to the left, um, and that's not very helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask it after this to then change that. So then can we fix that, right? So we'll say, can you put the data labels on the right of the points instead? And then so that chinchilla doesn't get cut off the end, um, can you increase the x-axis range to go up to 2000? And then it will spit out an updated version of that code. 
Um, and it will explain to us, uh, note that we just changed, where is it? Yeah. Note that we just changed the H just argument in geom text, which is there to be negative. So it was on the previous page, it was, uh, I think it was plus 1.2 and the labels were on the left, but we changed the horizontal adjustment to be negative 0.2, which shifted it to the right-hand side of the dot. Um, and then it also explains a little bit more. Um, so then we go to the next slide. So then, so then what I ask it for now is to explain what that particular line actually does in detail. And it's pretty good at coming up with an explanation. It tells us that geom text um, which is what with the labels on the graph, is a function in ggplot2 that adds text labels. That's correct. Um, it, it correctly explains what the AES function is doing. Um, it's saying which bits of data go where. Um, but then it makes a mistake. So it says that the H just argument that it, it literally only just used to flip the labels from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of each point, um, it says that it's doing the opposite of what it just used it to do. So that's a bit confusing. Um, and then I got that wrong. And then it spits out some more explanations of uh, other parts of that line of code that it got correct. Um, so yeah, not, not always correct. Very helpful, but not always correct. And good to check things that come out of it. Um, so then say I decided, oh, I really like that graph, but I want to put it on my blog, on a web page. Um, so instead of having R code to do it, I would like to have it be in HTML to make a web page. And I would like the graph to be plotted using the JavaScript Plotly library. Um, so I just asked ChatGPT, can you translate it into a HTML script um, with the JavaScript Plotly library and put the label above the points in the scatter plot? Um, and so then it literally does that. It spits out the code. Um, we can copy that. We can put it into JS Fiddle. And this is the graph that we get now. This, this is the graph that we get out. Um, we get the graph, um, it's labeled pretty well. It's not all that bad. Um, and it works fine as a web page. So you can make web pages. Um, one thing that ChatGPT can do in some ways better than Google Translate is translate colloquial expressions. So because it's uh, a model that's been trained on just giant reams of text that have been sitting out there on the internet in more than one language, um, any colloquial expression which comes up often enough, it can often uh, translate the, the actual meaning behind into a, a phrase that means the equivalent thing in the other language rather than the literal translation, like the words that are used. So for example, um, fala meu bruxo uh, in Portuguese uh, is a greeting that um, someone might say to someone else like, hey bro, what's up? Um, but literally what it means is, uh, what's up my wizard? And you can see that uh, in Google Translate, it said, speak my witch, which is obviously not the, the meaning of the phrase. Um, but ChatGPT has translated it correctly and given you an explanation to say that Bruxo is often used to refer to a close friend or someone you have a good relationship with. Um, we have another example here, which um, I won't even try to pronounce the Chinese, but uh, literally, it translates to don't be a light bulb, right? But if you put it in ChatGPT and you ask it to translate it to English, it will it will say that uh, in meaning, it translates to don't be a third wheel in English, even though literally in Chinese, it's don't be a light bulb. Um, so it can translate the meaning a whole lot better than Google Translate, for example. And so I guess to put a comparison, so one thing just to show off here is I've entered in a very similar prompt to uh, Gordon here, asking what this Chinese phrase means. Uh, and it's, it's just decided it's to translate it into English. This time it has told me that it's a idiom, meaning don't be a light bulb. And so if we compare that to if you type this same question into Google search, um, you'll see the Google Translate show up on top where it'll tell you, it says it's literally don't be a light bulb. But then you'll look down and you'll see articles that will be explaining what this idiom means. So there's like, don't be a third, it's like, don't be a third wheel. And so this, I guess the big difference here between um, ChatGPT and something like Google Translate is Google Translate is a machine translation tool that provides a literal translation. They've tried to implement ways to do, um, to deal with idioms and colloquialisms, but um, the strength of ChatGPT or GPT-3 in general is that it has absorbed all of this information, both 
literal translations as well as these like you know culture specific colloquial terms that may mean something different than what they literally mean. All right, so uh, another task that uh, ChatGPT can be really helpful at is breaking down a task into smaller steps, right? So for example, say, what steps do I need to take to organize a physics conference? Uh, make me a numbered list of short dot points. Um, I specified short there because ChatGPT can a lot of the time be quite verbose in its answers. And in order to get a small list rather than a wall of paragraphs of text, I asked it and that's what I got. Um, so it's done a pretty good job there. It's broken down into things I might want to do. I might want to determine the subject, the theme, the scope of the conference, identify potential speakers, get a venue, create a budget, get a website, develop a schedule, manage logistics, um, coordinate with everyone to make sure it all works out, organize social events. Um, it's got a pretty good list. So uh, it can be pretty good at scaffolding, you know, tasks into smaller steps. Um, it can do the same thing for research tasks. It can do the same thing for tasks that you may have to do in everyday life. Um, it, it's especially helpful for uh, complicated ones. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Can chat GBT input be an audio file? No, it cannot. So it only deals in text. Um, it doesn't deal in voice. However, uh, you can... There are there are ways to add, use add-ons so that you can uh, ask the question verbally and it will transcribe it into text before putting it into the model. Um, another thing you can use it for, um, it's been popular in the media to, to find out that uh, ChatGPT has passed the American medical exam. So if you ask it medical questions, um, enough times you'll get the right answer so that it can pass a medical exam and effectively be a doctor. Um, however, as you've seen all of the examples before where it's been hallucinating answers, um, that's not always the best thing to take without doing some kind of a check to make sure that you aren't getting terrible advice um, from it. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to take some potluck statistical advice. And the way I like to think of it is, you know, on Google, there's an I'm feeling lucky button, or at least there used to be, or there sometimes is. If you click that, you just get taken straight through to the first search result whether or not that's actually applicable to your question and answering it. And so it, you, you're, you're taking a chance, you're going to the casino. Um, so let's ask it for a statistical question. So I have a data set of 50 points in the control group and two points I want to test to see if they come from the same distribution. What test can I use? Um, and what does it responded with? It's actually a pretty reasonable answer. It's first of all flagged that I have a pretty small sample size and that might be a good thing to think about. Um, and then it suggested a test, um, a Man Whitney U test, um, which is actually a reasonable, a reasonable answer to the question. There are other answers that might be equally appropriate, and it suggested a few of them as well. Um, what it hasn't done is it hasn't asked for further information about where did those 50 points come from? What do they actually mean? How do they measure them? Um, are they a time series? Is there an autocorrelation? It hasn't asked me for further feedback that would allow it to provide a better answer. So when doing these kinds of things, uh, more specific is, is, is definitely better and don't necessarily trust the answers completely off that without you know, checking them with an expert um, if they're important to you and without researching further. So it told me what I should do. I should do a man Whitney U test. So I'm gonna ask it, how can I run the test in R? And it will provide me with some code, okay? So I copy the code, I do it in R, and it goes, and it gives me an answer. It gives me a p-value for testing in these particular, this particular example data here. Um, but one thing it did is it told me that this argument here, um, that one, should say exact equals false. Um, and if you read the documentation, uh, you want to use exact equals false when you have a very large sample size in order to make the computation feasible, but it already told me that I had a small sample size, so it probably should have told me to use exact equals true. So I asked it that, um, and then it says, oh, actually, you're right, it should actually be true. Whoops, here we go, here's an updated example. And so it's, it's given me exact equals true um, here now in the updated code. Um, so I copy paste that and they run the test. However, confusingly, it doesn't stop there. It gives me an example output 
of what the test will output with completely wrong numbers in it that it just made up to sound plausible. Um, and if you run it in R, you get you get this this answer instead, which is actually the, the correct answer um, rather than it's made up stuff up there. So always take it with a grain of salt and always check. So something that you can use it for as well is helping you with rephrasing or rewriting um, emails or different bits of text. So it's obviously absorbed lots of emails. So in this case, I had it write out an email to refuse uh, making a infinite energy machine to Gordon because it's not part of my natural job. It's not part of my work. Um, and I had it write it out. It wrote out one email. It looked a little bit verbose. And so one thing that's nice, is you can... If you give it a bit of text, uh, you can ask it to do it again, but make it more concise. So in this case, it has slimmed it down quite nicely. And I think this is a pretty decent uh, rejection email. So other potential use cases of this would be, you know, anytime you're having to write stuff like this, you could use this for inspiration to get some ideas, uh, tips for how to make things more concise uh, or rewording things in a way that maybe sound a little bit more professional. Um. And, and for, for using it for emails or for uh, interpersonal interactions, I find that it's a it's a really good uh, it's really good at being able to phrase things in a way that that says things clearly but kindly, which I'm perhaps a little bit bad at, um, rather than being quite so direct and maybe a little bit harsh. Um, so it's it's good for smoothing smoothing interactions that you can have over over text like email, for example. All right, so here's a bit of an esoteric example. Um, developers, software developers spend a lot of time building APIs and backends, um, whereas sometimes you might just want something mocked up quickly to, you might want something mocked up quickly to build your front end around of your website. Um, so say you're making a to-do list, you can turn ChatGPT or GPT-3 into an API and a database instantly, and it will automatically figure out what kind of a structure might it might need to respond with, or at least pretend that it has inside itself and respond appropriately. So you can, um, you, can, you can input the contents of the database and tell it that it is an API in a database and it will behave as such. So you are an API in a database. Here's the current state. We've got three to-do items, buy milk, do laundry, clean room. Um, two of them have been done, but the laundry hasn't been done yet. And we tell it to respond to API requests and not to be too verbose. Um, so then we give it a request. We say, get, do laundry. And it does. It returns this item and it says, title, do laundry, completed, false. All right. So then we go to the next slide. We say, uh, let's make a new request. Let's say, put, to do, do laundry, and change, completed, to be true, because we've done the laundry now. And so then it responds, confirming that that was actually updated in the database, even though the database is actually only being simulated. So um, just to quickly answer a question, um, I think that the there's a question about can you put a calendar put in put a calendar and see available time slots and turn that into an email. Um, I think that that's a sort of question where you have to spend a lot of time and it'd probably be faster just to write it up by hand. Because when I've done similar sorts of things, like say asking to like randomize a list of names from Excel, it just literally copy pastes the same list I put in. Um, so that's one that may need a little bit of extra time. Um, okay. So one example of where it can be really, really effective is just continuing on with this code stuff. Um, so like, let's say you have a, a function that you've written in R and you want to add in exception handling. So exception handling is when, say you have a piece of code and you run it, but there's some sort of error in there and then it just stops. Instead of just stopping with, you know, say the code thing failed, you want it to spit out a little message to handle different uh, cases where it could fail. So in this case, uh, I asked it to add an exception handling, and it's done a pretty fantastic job. It's put in um, something says like if there's a if the name variable here in this hello world function is missing, it will say name argument is missing. If the name if the thing that's inputted in there is not a character string, it will input an error. It'll say this is this needs to be a character string, and then it will run if it actually runs. And it does a great job here describing what it's doing. This is all pretty good, which makes sense because if you've ever looked at how to learn any of these programming languages, they always use this example as the first thing to learn how to learn a new language. You can also then have it write out sort of um, the generic type of documentation that you'd see in official documentation for like an R package or a Python library. And so in this case, I asked it to write documentation for the greeting function. 
and it's done an amazing job. And what's really cool is, or if you go to the next slide, is you can see that it has explained what it's done and why. And it's done a pretty good job here with this. I, I think from when I read over it, it doesn't look like it made any mistakes here. It's done a pretty good job of explaining why it wrote these things out and what all these different little bits mean. And this could be helpful for you going forward because then next time you ever to write it out by yourself, you have some inspiration to go from and you know what all these different things mean. It can also be used to write tests for your code. So tests are something where, you know, you have a bit of code and you want to be able to make sure that it produces the output that you expect. And tests are something that historically many people struggle to get used to writing in the first place. And so ChatGPT can do a really good job at making these for you, where it just makes little tests, tests all sorts of different things to see, does your code actually work? And uh, these run and they produce the expected output. So what are some areas where it struggles? Well, we kind of touched on this already, but one of the things that's clear is that, so um, it struggles with haikus. So I was sitting there and I'm like, I, chat GPT, write me a haiku about Excel. I love Excel, Excel is amazing. Let's get a, one that's about the beauty of Excel. It wrote this out and it was quite nice. Cells like boxes, formulas bring them to life. Excel sings with math. That sounded great. But then um, if you're familiar with what a haiku is, a haiku is a short poem with five syllables in the first line, seven in the next, and five in the final one. Uh, this fails the haiku test, it's not a haiku. I then asked, I didn't. I, to, I told ChatGPT this, and then asked it to make one that has the correct syllable structure. And it's done a good job there. I then asked it to write a haiku about why an AI chatbot might struggle with this task of writing haikus with the correct syllable structure. And it wrote one that's pretty good, programmed to converse, machines lack humans, human nature's verse, Haikus elude bots, and that's true, but it's not a haiku because AI language models are trained on written text. Syllables are an element of spoken language that is not something this model could ever learn. So fundamentally, the model can't do what it doesn't know how to do or what it could never have done in the first place. So um, also, uh, especially when ChatGPT first came around, it was really bad at even basic math. Um, however, they did have made some improvements to try to make it do a little bit better job. It could do things like one plus one equals two, but um, it would struggle with more complicated examples. However, in this example where we've put in, uh, you know, calculating so if my budget is this for the year and so-and-so has more budget than me um, and spent this much on their lunch, how much does he have? And it's able to produce a calculation there. It, it explains how it got to that. Um, and it got the correct answer. However, the next one, um, when you add a whole bunch of numbers, addition one after the other, it gets an answer 47, which is wrong uh, when you compare it versus like a calculator, in this case, we used R. It also fails, it just fundamentally is not a calculator. Um, in this case, I asked for one plus one and it equals two, because that's probably, we've seen that in text a bajillion times. However, square root of one through seven times pi is much less common, so the model has no idea what to input. It gets an answer that's you know actually within a decent ballpark. Uh, it's a decent guess, but it's fundamentally just not correct. It's not a calculator. It can't do that. Um, another thing that uh, the model can can do is uh, things within its training date. So that the data that was trained on in this particular case for ChatGPT at the moment ended in September 2021. So all of the things that it knows about happened before then and anything after then it doesn't know about, right? So if you ask it, um, what is the hometown of the 2021 Australian Open Women's Champion? That's before. So it should be included in the training data. And it complains a little bit, but then it does tell us um, that the 2021 Australian Open Women's Champion is Naomi Osaka and she is from Japan. But it did not answer the question of what is her hometown. Luckily, in ChatGPT, you can prompt it to keep going and answer the actual question you wanted. So I ask it, what is her hometown? And it says, Naomi Osaka was born in Choku, Osaka, Japan. Um, and just on the right here, we have the comparison of putting that in GPT-3, the model that it's built upon. Um, and that gets the answer right and spits it out straight away. Correct. However, um, if you ask it questions about things that are outside of the uh, after the date at which the training data stops, it gets them wrong. So if you say, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Sydney? Um, it does at least explain that, I'm sorry, I do not have real-time information. Um, my knowledge cutoff date of September 2021, at that point in time, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research 
was Professor Duncan Iverson, which is true, but unhelpful because it's not answering the question of who currently is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research. Whereas if you ask the same question to GPT-3, it just doesn't, it doesn't add the, the safety layer, the warning that it's maybe past its cutoff and it doesn't know, it just spits out the wrong answer. Um, so how can we fix things like that? Well, um, one way to do that is to integrate search. So if we use a combination of the, uh, the prompting techniques uh, we mentioned at the beginning, um, and then we make a new tool, uh, where what happens is it, it fills out the question. So it says, um, what is the favorite seafood of the University of Sydney Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research? And then it asks itself, are there follow-up questions needed here? Yes. What is the follow-up question? Who is the University of Sydney Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research? That's a pretty good follow-up question. The intermediate answer to that question is, well, what, what we've done here is um, we've taken the blue, who is the University of Sydney Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research. We fed it into a Google search. We take the first result back. We incorporate that back into the model as the intermediate answer. Emma Johnson appointed as new Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Sydney. And then we let the model continue. And it says, are follow-up questions needed here? Yes. What is the follow-up question? What is Emma Johnson's favorite seafood? And then as it asked another follow-up question, we send that back to Google, get the first response back. And then the intermediate answer is um, from this uh, AFR article where Emma was interviewed um, by the AFR. She says, I love mussels. They are good because they are low in the food chain and you can eat as many as you like and grow some more. So the final answer is mussels. And the model actually quite um, surprisingly gets all the way to a pretty good answer to that question. And so this is something that is kind of the next step for these models is something that this this thing called the tool former is a, uh, a basic a similar large language model that was a uh, paper just came out it's not yet publicly available from uh, meta and it incorporates five different tools as it, and it lets the language model understand a prompt and know when it needs to use one of these tools where instead of just relying on statistical likelihood it uses one of these tools and consults them for the answer. So for example, looking up the answer on Wikipedia and providing you a little thing, like a link, this is where I found this answer somewhere else rather than just making it up. And so this is kind of the next step in allowing these models to solve all sorts of problems and be really useful. However, at the same time, there's a lot of things that we need to touch on with uh, regards to using these models. So the first thing to mention is that use of these can violate academic integrity. This is rapidly changing. This policy is draft new policy just came out uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and one of the things to be aware of here is that use of generative AI tools such as ChatGPT, uh, it is a, a breach of academic integrity. Uh, it can also be considered as contract cheating here. So. Um, it should not be used by people as part of any assessments. And an important thing to consider is that, uh, like say your PhD thesis, for example, is part of assessment. Um, however, the tricky thing here that's gonna be difficult to, uh, to look at going forward is how are we gonna know if these tools are being used? So OpenAI has come out with tools to um, try to detect things that are generated by their stuff, but the accuracy is worse than random chance. Uh, it's very, very poor. It's incredibly hard to tell confidently, assuredly, that something's been generated by AI. And this presents a lot of concerns for us going forward, because if we, imp we if any people try to implement tools to detect AI content, the risk of false accusations is very high. Um, so we really, at the moment, don't have any way to definitively say if we know something's been made by AI or not. Another major concern uh, that's brought up earlier is the fact that anytime you use a product that is free, you're not using a product, you are the product. So OpenAI is relying on all of us using their tools, uh, entering in questions, getting answers back, creating these conversations they can use to build successively more powerful, better models. That is, that is what we are, we are their product. And all of the conversations we answer, every single bit in there, they view all of it, they own all of it. So all of these will be reviewed by them and used to improve their models. Anything you put in will help train their models to do better, which also means that let's say if you enter in 
some private information that could potentially be generated in the future when someone else enters in a question, they may get your private information generated back at you. Same thing with code. If you enter in private code that you want to have the license for, that code may then be generated again going forward. This is something that really people need to be aware of, that every single thing they enter in there could is going to help make these models better and could appear again. OpenAI has kind of touched on this. You know, the next question asks, well, what happens if uh, you use content that's been generated by OpenAI's tools in something that you want to either sell or publish? Well, OpenAI has said that they will not claim copyright over content, and that, I believe, that is a post that was made by a human, not ChatGPT. I then also asked ChatGPT, and it said, no, they won't claim copyright. However, you should check the terms of services. So let's go take a look at that. So if we look at the terms of service here, it's a standard kind of legal document. Um, and they specify in here that when you're using their tools, you're entering into this agreement. And any content that you put into their services and any content that is outputted from their services uh, is theirs. But they assign to you the ability to use it for wherever you want but they retain the right to use it as necessary to you know, help improve their services. Um, yeah, so it's still theirs, but they'll let you use it. Um, I then put this same thing back in there to ChatGPT to ask it to explain it, and I think it did a decent job of explaining here. Um, you really should be careful about any content you put into this. Um, There's a question there that I don't know the answer to. Does the same issue of content capture apply to tools like Elicit? I don't know the answer to that, uh, but we could get back to you if you'd like us to check in on that. Uh, the final thing to really raise here is a question of how ChatGPT was made. So remember earlier we were comparing it versus some of OpenAI's other tools and how they this now features a content filter. Well, how was this content filter made? They knew they needed to put one in there that was smart and able to offensive to remove this offensive content. Um, however, they didn't want to do it themselves. They paid a firm called Sama to develop this filter. And Sama went off to hire a bunch of workers in Kenya to be paid incredibly low wages. These are not high wages in Kenya. This is low wages in Kenya to sit there and read and label content, including details of all sorts of horrible things to be able to help OpenAI's models more effectively not generate or screen out offensive content. And the thing that's a concern here is that um, the University of Sydney's modern slavery policy uh, has you know, stated that we're making efforts to uh, mitigate the use of tools, services, products in the supply chain uh, of any of our operations that may involve uh, things that would be considered modern slavery. And so these practices uh, are something that's of a serious concern. And so in general, um, you know, this is a rapidly evolving situation, um, but our suggestions for, this is not like legal advice, but our suggestions for how to make use of this effectively is you know, to use it for brainstorming, bouncing ideas back and forth. You can see it can be really effective for all sorts of different things, but at the same time, really be skeptical and fact check your answers um, and only enter in things like information or code that you are okay with OpenAI having ownership of or using for whatever they want and that you're okay with anyone else potentially seeing. Don't enter in your you know, groundbreaking research findings before you publish them in nature. Um, you should probably be careful with that. And definitely don't enter in anybody's private details or any highly sensitive protected data. Um, anything that's IP that you want to protect, don't, don't put it in here. Um, but luckily it's usually easy enough to rearrange things that might be sensitive or IP so that you're asking the question in a much more general sense and get the answer and then tailor it back to your specific protected case afterwards. Um, and obviously don't put your bank account details in there. I don't know why you would, but don't do that. Um, so that brings us to the end of our talk, um, luckily right on 4 p.m. Um, if anybody wants to give us feedback and we would love all of you to give us feedback, um, you can either go to a link or we thought maybe it's better to have a QR code. So if you scan that, you'll go to the feedback form and you can tell us what you thought of the talk and what you would like in future. Um, 
I think we're at the end of our time, but if anybody has questions, we're happy to stay on and answer some of them. Uh, Ahmed, I think you've got your hand up with a question. Yes. Yeah. So thanks, um, Henry and Gordon, for, for that nice uh, presentation. I'm actually um, interested in chat GPT um, and using it as a tool for answering questions, which uh, or in other words, like FAQs, uh, which we receive um, like to from our users. So we are a facility, we have instruments and we have users. So the, the users like ask uh, questions, which um, uh, I can see like they are uh, frequently like repetitive, but from different people. So I tried before to feed chat GPT with specific uh, uh, questions and answers, but I got like a kind of complicated code. So are you aware of any tool which uh, I can learn so that I can feed chat GPT with specific questions? And uh, answers? There, are, there are many different ways to do it. Uh, probably chat GPT isn't the right tool for the job, but okay. um, GPT-3 could be the right tool for the job. There are different okay. options. So you can either fine tune your own model using either one of those models or any, any, other, any other reasonably large model. Um, and then that fine-tuned model would be trained on data where you've answered people's questions so that it will be able to kind of copy you and try to answer new questions as they come in. Another option is to create a, a prompt for GPT-3 that has a bunch of um, answered uh, FAQ questions or a bunch of information about your service that it can then draw okay. upon to answer the questions that come in. Those are, those are two, three relatively simple ways to, to do that. Um, there's another option that would in, involve embedding. So you could embed the user's question, compare it to a database of FAQ answers to see which one it most closely matches or relates to, and then feed them back the, the, the database answer. And many of these sorts of tools are already you know, implemented in many different websites, uh, services with helping you know, connect users with answers to their questions. Yeah. Okay, so they do you have an example? Hmm? Sorry? Do you, do you just like have an example of that? An example of... Not at the moment. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay, thank you. Not off the top of the head. Cool. Do we have any other questions? Uh, no, for me, thank you. Yeah, for anyone, anyone else in the room, do we have any more questions? A lot of requests for the recording. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, if you if you email uh, either of us or sh.info or sh.training at sydney.edu.au, um, then we can also distribute the recording and the slides to you as well. Sorry, um, what was that email to get the um, recording distributed? Um, yeah, look up Sydney Informatics Hub and then yeah. contact us. Thanks for pasting in there, Tracy. So in chat, Tracy's pasted in a, a email address. Um, but yeah, um, if you guys are interested in anything else, be very happy to uh, you know be in touch with us. Uh, happy to talk about anything related to uh, data and how SIH could maybe help you with your research or use of all sorts of exciting tools in the future. And come along to the next masterclass, uh, which I think the, the the upcoming one, which will be at near the end of March, mm -hmm. will be on how to use a tool called Orange Data Mining to interrogate your data like super fast, like you would not believe fast once you get used to the tool. Without code. Without learning how to code. Yeah. All. all right. Um, if there's no more questions, then I guess we're done here. And thank you very much for your time. All right, see you later. Thank you.